Shalom brothers and sisters and welcome to our happy Sabbath service for sacrament. I'm afraid I'm on my own today because Kyle has, has had to go and do something for a friend. Uh, it's glad to see you on this Saturday morning and I will be sharing the sacrament prayer with you. And we'll be using the combined prayer from Community of Christ. So hopefully you've got your emblems and your wine ready. Let us pray for the Spirit to be with us today. Heavenly Father, thank you God that we can be here today. And we invite your Spirit to be with us as we take the sacrament that your spirit will be with us and that we get to know you more and we can feel you and that we can share that love with the people we, we meet in our daily life. So Lord, we ask that your spirit will be with us and I say these things in your gift to us, Jesus Christ's name, Amen. Yes, brothers and sisters, it's a Sabbath day and time to take our sacrament. At this time, we welcome all present to Christ's table. We invite all who would participate to do so as an expression of the peace and love of Jesus Christ, in whose name we worship. The Lord's Supper is a sacrament, a time to focus on the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As disciples of Christ, we renew our covenants and recommit together to his mission, to grow closer to Jesus Christ, as individuals and as a community, worshipping Jesus Christ through God's Word, the sacraments, ministry, outreach, Kabbalah, and Jubilee. We encourage all that are worthy to receive communion to do so frequently and devoutly. And I should be saying, as I said before, the combined prayer of the bread and the wine. So if you may bow or nail, whichever is best for you. O oh God, the Eternal Father, we ask thee in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this bread and wine to the souls of those who partake of them, that they may eat and drink in remembrance of the body and blood of thy Son, and witness unto thee, O God, the Eternal Father, that they are willing to take upon them the name of thy Son, and always remember him, and keep his commandments, which he has given them, that they may always have his Spirit to be with them. Amen. So as we take the sacrament, remembering what Christ did for us, he died for us, and we're thankful for that. Shalom, brothers and sisters, and welcome to this week's Sabbath message. The scripture for this week is Romans three twenty through 23. By the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all, and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So today's message, I want to talk to you about sin. And while that's a good scripture, I actually want to jump to the Book of Mormon, in, in the Book of Alma. And here Alma is talking to one of his sons. So I, I want to be very clear here. I want to go over some different things, but I want to start off by explaining that sin... I grew up in a very rural community. And when I tried going to other churches, it was just a lot of everybody's a sinner. And people at school, kids at school, when we talked about religion, because yes, people came and talked about religion because I've told you about my situation before. When teachers point you out, 
that makes children curious. And so I had a lot of conversations with a lot of people of different ages about religion. And one of the things that is unique about the Latter-day Saint movement and Kabbalah is the idea of the fortunate fall. The idea that Adam fell, that man might be. Adam and Eve fell, I should say, that man might be. Whereas the thing that I was hearing from my fellow students and at these other churches that I, I checked out when I was younger was this idea that we're all just evil because we're born with the curse of, of Adam upon us. And I find that idea ridiculous. The idea that God would say, okay, well, I created this, these, these human beings just to send them all to hell. You know, I'm, I'm not very happy that I made this. I obviously messed up. I mean, that doesn't sound like a, 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 a good God or even an actual God if, if God can't create what he actually wants to create. And I think that a big problem with that is the fact that we don't understand what sin really is. Sin is generally defined as, quote, an immoral act considered to be a transgression against divine law, end quote. And that's from Lexico. Uh, the Hebrew word translated to sin in the Old Testament comes from the root word chet, which means to miss the mark. So, the idea here isn't that that you've done this awful thing and that you're born wicked or anything like that. It's just that, you know, there's a straight path to God and you got off the path. You know, you're not holding to the rod. And I like this idea because when people take the concept of sin and they make it something that just seems impossible to walk away from, and that's that really is Satan's whole shtick, right? You're never going to be good enough for God. Whereas God's like, hey, you know, you just missed the mark a little bit. Come back. It's all good. I forgive you. I love you. Remember John 3.17. God didn't come to condemn the world but to save it. Now, Jesus didn't come to condemn the world but to save it. So, I want to take a look at what Alma had to say to his son. So, he says, and this is in verse uh, Alma 1972 RAV. And for those that don't remember or don't know, um, RAV is the, it's what the reorganized churches use the community of Christ and that would be so 1973 REV and 4110 is where we're going to start and the OPV and OPV is the Orson Pratt verses or version um, and that's the one obviously that Orson Pratt came up with because they didn't own the copyright to the local Mormon so Brigham Young asked him to add verses and change the chapters so that they could make their own copy, copyright version of the Book of Mormon uh, for the Salt Lake City Church. It says, Do not suppose, because it has been spoken concerning restoration, that ye shall be restored from sin to happiness. Behold, I say unto you, wickedness never was happiness. Now, this to me is the key. When you talk about, I mean, you talk about, in all men Adam fell, and in Christ all are made alive, this says in the New Testament. And there's a lot of really good scriptures out there about sin. But I think that this helps us to understand the issue here. Wickedness never was happiness. Because wickedness is nothing more, in my mind, than egoism. Doing what we want to do for our own selfish pleasure. And the problem with that is that we, our, our egos, our egoism, is, is like a... a a beast. It's like a tapeworm. It's always just hungry. And so, it's like, oh, if I just had this one more, there was a movie that came out, uh, Wonder Woman 1984, and in it, the bad guy is like, what if you have more? What if there's more? And like that, that just reminds me of egoism. No matter what, you, you, it can never be full. You know, if I just had $5, I could get what I need. You get the $5. You get what you need. But I, if I just had five more dollars, no, that's not enough. Ten dollars, no, a hundred dollars. I mean, that in my mind is the problem with capitalism, right? The whole point of capitalism is greed. You want to get to the top and have all of the wealth and all of the money. You know, it's basically a monopoly, the game in real life. And so, because you never be full, eventually you just run out. There's nothing more to get. And then what? You're not satisfied. Why? It says right here. Because wickedness never was happiness. But 
if you have just five dollars and you share it with a friend now i'll give you an example when i was younger if you know i was hanging out with my friends and we had enough money just for one combo meal and it didn't matter if i had the money or one of my other friends had the money or we we're pooling our money together we would you know go to the restaurant we would get our combo meal and it's okay well here's a portion of the hamburger for you here's a portion of the fries for you and you know, it's unlimited drinks and, and we would share what we had. And we were happy. Not because we got to fill our bellies with a, you know, whatever double cheeseburger or what have you. But because of the fact that no one went without. And it didn't matter that we didn't have enough. Because we had each other. That's true happiness. So it says in verse uh, 75 REV 11 OPV. And now my son, all men are in the state of... Or of nature, or I would say in a carnal state, are in the gall of bitterness and the bonds of iniquity. Why? Why would we be in a gall of bitterness? Because again, the grass is always greener on the other fence. I mean, there's all kinds of sayings about this. Because we can't, we can't ever get enough. We can't ever be full. And why are we in the bonds of iniquity? Because we're trapped. We can't see anything outside of ourselves. It's like we're we're blind. To the good things of God, uh, you know, I have this. I've had this issue as my children are growing up, where they get in this negative state, where it's like, well, you know, my friend has this toy and I don't. My sibling has this thing and I don't. I don't feel loved enough. And it's like, hey, appreciate what you have, because you're not going to get everything. And if you did have everything, you would still be unhappy, because having things isn't what makes you happy. They're without God in the world. And they have gone contrary to the nature of God. Because isn't egoism the idea of taking for self the exact opposite of what God teaches? If you look at the law, you look at the Torah, and you look at the teachings of the prophets, what are they saying over and over again? Everything they're saying is, stop making it about you. Learn how to live as a community. Learn how to love one another. To care for one another. It's not enough to just say, oh, I love my neighbor. Oh, I love my enemy. What are we doing to reach out our hands and help these people? To make their needs and wants our needs and wants. And to care for one another. And to not do it in order to get gain or praise or reward. Because if you do that, then it's merely a transaction. Right? I'm going to help you because you're going to owe me one. That's a transaction. That's a, I'm going to give you $5 and you're going to give me this item. And at that point... They're, they're, you've had your reward. You've received your reward. Whatever it was that you did your deed for. And, and does that make you happy? Of course not. Because that's the egoism. Verse 76 and verse 12. And now behold. Is the meaning of the word restoration. To take a thing of a natural state. And place it in an unnatural state. Is it taking a fish and putting it in the desert with no water, or to place it in a state opposite to its nature. O oh, my son, this is not the case, but the meaning of the word restoration is to bring back again evil for evil, or carnal for carnal, or devilish for devilish, good for that which is good, righteous for that which is righteous, just for that which is just, merciful for that which is merciful. So true repentance True Teshiva, true abandonment of sin, is walking away from the egoism. Because if you did it for a selfish reason, you're going to receive selfishness in return. But if you do it for altruistic reasons, for Christ-like love, then you will receive Christ-like love. Maybe not from the person that you gave to. Maybe they're just going to take to themselves. But you'll receive that Christ-like love from Christ himself, from God, which is a far greater reward. Therefore, my son, verses 78 or 14, see that you're merciful unto your brethren, deal justly, judge righteously, and do good continually. And if ye do all these things, then ye shall receive your reward. But we don't do this for a reward. We do it because it's the right thing to do. Because the reward that we receive isn't some punishment. That's, that's a human concept. You did something bad, and therefore you should be punished. A godly way of looking at this is to say, once you've transformed who you are, you're able to let go of, of the regret. 
You're able to let go of the past. You're able to move forward in Christ like it never happened. Because in God's mind, it didn't. That's the beauty of the atonement of Jesus Christ. We can repent of our sins and move forward like it never happened. Now, that doesn't mean that there won't be worldly consequences. Because in this world, it's hard for us to let go of bad things that happen. And the worse the thing is to happen, the harder it is for us to let go. Whether that be, when I say us, whether that's us personally, which is something we have to work through with the Savior as we overcome our human weakness and doubts. But in some cases, it's also what you might do and how it affects some in how it affects someone else and the repercussions of that. So please don't think that just because you said you're sorry and you repented that there won't be if you if you break a window, that window still has to be fixed. And you may still be liable for damages. It's basically what I'm trying to say here. Verse eighty, and ye shall have good reward unto you again, for that which ye do send out shall return unto you again to be restored. And that, to me, is the definition of, the re of restoration, as we're describing here in Alma, as Alma says to his son. Restoration is getting back what you give. Now, that doesn't mean you're owed something. That's the prosperity gospel. It means that if you put good out into the world, you'll be able to see good coming back to you because it's a matter of perception. So, brothers and sisters, when we talk about sin... The, the big thing in my mind is this. I find that the people that point fingers at others are doing so to avoid pointing fingers at themselves. So let's just keep our hands to ourselves. Let's love one another. And let's remember that sin is nothing more than missing the mark. Think about it in archery. There's a, a big target you're trying to hit. You want to hit bullseye dead center. When you first start shooting, you may not even hit the target itself. You may not even hit the thing the target's on. But as you get to know the Lord, as you develop that personal relationship with God, your aim gets better and better. Now, to God, your aim is perfect every time because you're striving forward, growing in grace, and that grace protects us. But because the Lord has made us new people, and because the Lord has made us new people, we do better. Because God transforms us. So, that's my message for you this Sabbath. And I'll leave it with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So, what's going on this week? Uh, this week, uh, got a games night at church this week at Community of Christ. Been still on Wednesday. And, uh, and then back for Sabbath morning. So, uh, I want you to, if you can, have a look at our website. Uh, the The link will be above my head or below, wherever David puts it. And uh, we'd like to leave with a closing prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. And we ask that you would be with us all this week and with the world as well, that you will help more peace come in our world. Lord, we need to have compassion for each other and we pray that you will help with that and that you will be with our friends, our enemies, our family. We love them all. And I say these things in Jesus' name. Amen.